In the scriptures, there are very few sacred instances in which the voice of God the Father has been heard. So when he says something, we really need to listen. Repeatedly, he has personally introduced his beloved son, Jesus Christ, with a specific charge to hear him. Have you ever stopped to ask why? Why is our Heavenly Father so insistent and consistent in His plea that we should hear His beloved Son, Jesus Christ? Jesus answered this question Himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our Father loves us and yearns for each one of us to choose to return to His Holy Presence. He pleads with us to listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, whom the Father anointed and appointed as our Mediator, Savior, and Redeemer. In this special year, as we commemorate the 200th anniversary of the First Vision, I invite you to think deeply and often about this key question, how do you hear him? I also invite you to take steps to hear him better and more often. Throughout this year, we will focus in a special way on this historic event that took place in the Sacred Grove. I invite you to be proactive and look for opportunities to share your feelings about the Lord Jesus Christ with your family and friends including inviting your friends to join you in worshiping Him on Easter Sunday. Now, as one of the Lord's special witnesses, I bless you in your efforts to get on and stay on His covenant path and strive with all your heart, might, mind, and soul to hear Him.
I would never take credit for his sweet, perfect love, but oh, how grateful I am that he allows me to just be a piece of the puzzle. I've always known that I hear through thoughts in my mind, I hear through feelings in my heart, impressions, emotions, but I've noticed that I hear, I, I hear names. I just had an experience yesterday uh, hearing a name. This dear sister, she had written a letter telling me about her favorite primary teacher from her childhood and why she was her favorite and why she loved her so much and what an influence she had had on her life. And she said, Sister Jones, I don't know why I'm writing this to you, but I feel that someone needs to know besides me how wonderful this woman is. And she's uh, now experiencing stage four cancer. I thought, well, I want to call her. I want to see if I can talk to her. So I thought, okay, well, I was getting ready to go into a meeting. And I thought, after my meetings, I'll call. Well, I didn't make it through very many meetings. And I, and I heard her name. And it was call now. So I picked up my phone. I went in the office, and I called. And her husband answered the phone. And um, he's on round-the-clock care. He's helping her. He said, let me check and see if my wife is awake. And he went in, and she was. And so I was able to read the letter to her. And it was a very emotional, sweet, tender experience that we shared together. And as I pondered that, it began because this dear sister in another state heard him. And then she gave me an opportunity to hear him. And then this family and I, talking on the phone together, had the opportunity to hear him together. I would never take credit for his sweet, perfect love, but oh, how grateful I am that he allows me to just be a piece of the puzzle. It's all him, and yet he lets us be a part of it. And in the process, we are uplifted, we are taught, we are inspired, we are loved, and it makes you just want to go do it more and more and more. I knew by revelation through this scripture that that's where the Lord wanted me to go. I've really felt strongly that the ways that I hear the Spirit of the Lord best in my life is by reading the scriptures and following promptings of the Holy Ghost. In my Gospel Library app, I have a whole section in that entitled, my scripture revelations. So this story I'm going to share occurred when I was 19. I had been anxiously awaiting my mission call. My father had gone on a mission to Germany. My brother had gone on a mission to Germany. I wanted to go to Germany on my mission. I walked out to our mailbox and there was the letter from the president of the church. Elder Ronald A. Rasband, you are hereby called to serve as a missionary in the Eastern States Mission, headquartered in New York City, New York. No, no, I'm supposed to go to Germany. And I was down, and I was disappointed. And I said, I better get a better attitude about this. So I went into my bedroom and I grabbed the Doctrine and Covenants, and I opened it, and I began reading. And I'd like to share with you the words of just two verses from the 100th section. 100th section, verse 3. As if the Lord were speaking to me, Behold, and lo, I have much people in this place, in the regions round about, and an effectual door shall be opened in the regions round about, in this eastern land. Therefore I, the Lord, have suffered you to come unto this place, for thus it was expedient in me for the salvation of souls. I had just been called to the Eastern States Mission, 
And here the Lord says, I've called you to this eastern land. And that fast, my attitude changed about not being called to be a German missionary, but going to the eastern states in New York City, I knew by revelation through this scripture that that's where the Lord wanted me to go. In this temple, I have seen so many miracles. Now rededicated, the Mesa, Arizona temple is once again performing sealings, the sacred ceremony that joins families together forever. My mom wanted a, an eternal family, and I think she wanted that even before she was a member of the church. She was looking for God. Four decades ago, this temple was the only place where families in the entirety of Latin America could participate in Spanish. Thousands of families made the northward trek, often at great sacrifice. My dad didn't want anything to do with the church. He had a lot of addictions. Those addictions made it hard for Denora's father to hold a job. When the church came to us, they helped my, my parents. They helped my mom to get an education. My dad was working so hard, and, and the boss liked him because he stopped drinking, and he, he was a bus driver. And one time they asked him to bring a group of people to the temple in Los Angeles. And he said that he saw many families going to the temple and he wanted to take us to the temple. That's how his desires become. We started preparing ourselves to come to the temple and we didn't know how many sacrifices were ahead of us. Denora's father suffered a stroke and was in a coma for several weeks. When my dad finally woke up from his coma, he asked my mom if she was still going to the temple preparation classes. And my mom says, no, I stopped them. And he said, go back, do it. We will go to the temple. He was very sick. And, and my mom was trying to ask the doctors if he was able to, well, to make a trip to Mesa, Arizona. And the doctors, they told my mom, he cannot even go to your house from the hospital. The doctors made Denora's mother sign a release absolving them of any responsibility. They warned he might die to make such a difficult journey. Denora's family of 11 left the next day from Guatemala on this bus bound for Mesa, Arizona. Because my dad needed to sit, to lay down on the whole uh, back part of the, of the bus. You know, sometimes we were standing for hours, you know, but we were talking, we were singing, we were doing things with people. And with money tight, the family subsisted on black bean and mayonnaise sandwiches. The hardest time was to watch my dad getting sick. But also we have faith that, that blessings will help him. You know, we traveled for five days, but when we got here on very late on December 3rd, the bus came exactly from this direction, showing the magnificent temple, you know? It was just an amazing thing. Everybody was in the bus, look at the temple. They were so happy. They were crying. We were singing. And at the same time, my mom was trying to wake my dad up, trying to help him to see this beautiful experience, to see this beautiful temple. Her father had no pulse. And, and then, of course, the panic started. But there was a nurse on the bus. And Abigail Jimenez, who was the nurse, she was the one who was uh, doing some CPR. And finally, uh, Sister Jimenez says, he is alive. Don't worry, he's okay. Weary, they were given meals and warm beds, prepared by local members in the stake center where dozens of other families were also staying. We were so excited to, to be there, and people were so kind, so nice. December 5th, it was so amazing because my dad was the one who was super ready, and my brother helped him. Remarkably, Denora's father was able to walk several blocks from the stake center to the temple that morning. I cannot describe my feelings of that day because it was amazing to see my parents so pure and clean because when they were wearing their white dresses, since I remember that, 
and looking at them and I saw them so beautiful. I really saw that I, I was with angels and also all my siblings, we were around that altar. To me, it was a miracle. I'm grateful that my father chose God and because he chose God, we have a hope to become an eternal family. Denora now volunteers at the same building that gave her family shelter and food during their stay in Mesa more than 40 years ago. They were here, were ready to help us because they knew that we had nothing. You know, every day, every week that I go there, I am so grateful because I see that that place gave us food and give us a place to feel warm. And I am now the coordinator of the Mesa Welcome Center for Immigrants, and I want them to feel welcome. I want them to see the hand of God. Okay. This will be your home. I think that sometimes we said, oh, I sacrificed so much, but the truth is being filled in this temple for us was such a big blessing, such a great opportunity. I, now I don't remember that those as a sacrifice. It's just tiny little things that God asks us, but then His hands are so open for all the blessings. We all come to a point in our life where we're trying to figure things out, figure out who we are. Where does religion, where does spirituality fit in our lives? I'm a perfectionist. It's been a huge struggle for me to n have absolutely no control over the way I envisioned my life would be and just trusting that God has a plan. It's been very hard for me. And of course, I have this vision of my life. I want four to six kids. So we start trying. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. There's no problem to fix, which would make things a lot easier if there was a problem to fix. In the midst of all this infertility, I have a sister who's 18 months younger than me. And one day I get a phone call from my mom. Kayla, I have something to tell you. And I just knew, I just started crying. And I just said, no, no, mom, no. And she said, yeah, I'm sorry, Dahlia's passed away. And I'm struggling to have a baby. I'm struggling to, um, you know, bring this beautiful spirit into our home and have this home and, and I'm doing all the things. And then I lose my sister, you know? So in my mind, I'm like, you, God doesn't want to give me a baby. God wants to take my sister. I stopped talking to him. I stopped praying. I didn't want anything to do with it because why? What, what good is it doing me? I didn't like the person I was becoming because not only was I not praying and I didn't want to talk to him, but when I was out and about and I was around people who were pregnant or talking about pregnancy, I, I envied them. and I, I didn't like the feeling in my heart that I was having. And it wasn't me. I knew it wasn't me. My husband said to me, Kayla, God doesn't care if you're mad and angry. He wants you to talk to him either way. So I got down on my knees and I started praying. I let it all out. I just, I yelled. I said, I'm angry. I don't want to talk to you. And then when I got done praying, I thought, gosh, that felt good. And I felt some sort of peace from that, which was like, okay. If I felt peace yelling at God in my prayers, that must mean that He's happy I'm talking to Him. He's happy to hear from me. Not just the good things. We don't just pray when things are going good. We're supposed to pray when things are hard. We're supposed to pray when, when we don't want to because He knows us. He knows our heart. He knows all of our trials, all of our sorrows, all of the pain that we're going through. He already knows. Sometimes we focus so much on, well, if God can make this happen, then why isn't He making it happen? And I'm starting to ac accept more that maybe my life isn't going to be what I envisioned and what I wanted, what I think I deserve, but it's okay. I feel peace in the trials that I've had because of the overwhelming amount of love that I feel from my Savior and His grace. So I feel like I can, I can get through anything.
Fear is not new. The disciples of Jesus Christ out on the Sea of Galilee feared the wind and the waves in the dark of the night. As his disciples today, we too have fears. Widows fear going forward alone. Teenagers fear not being accepted. Grade schoolers fear the first day of school. University students fear getting back a test. We feel failure, rejection, disappointment, and the unknown. The world will always be scary. There's always opposition in all things. And there's definitely things that are ugly, but where I find peace is the savior. We fear not being chosen. We fear being chosen. We fear not being good enough. We fear the Lord has no blessings for us. We fear change, and our fears can escalate to terror. Everyone has to face uh, whatever challenges that come into our life. So we need not be hopeless. We can uh, exercise belief that uh, through the gospel, uh, there is a better future for us. The Lord knew that at times we would feel fear. I have been there, and so have you, which is why the scriptures are replete with the Lord's counsel. Be of good cheer, and do not fear. Look unto me in every thought. Doubt not, fear not. Fear ultimately is the unknown. When we have those times where we're scared or where we don't know what's going on, uh, that's what prayer's about. That's why he gave us the Holy Ghost, so that we don't have to feel alone, so that we can always have that peace and that comfort and that reassurance. How is fear dispelled? First, stand in holy places. When we stand in holy places, our righteous homes, our dedicated chapels, the consecrated temples, we feel the Spirit of the Lord with us. When we stand in holy places, we can feel God's love and perfect love casteth out all fear. The Savior helps me so much in dealing with fear and I turn to Him all the time. Even though it's a crazy, scary world, we have nothing to fear because we have Heavenly Father by our side. He is fully in control. The next promise is, be not troubled. No matter how much wickedness and chaos fills the earth, we are promised by our daily faithfulness in Jesus Christ, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Prayer is a source of uh, help that God extends to us. Because of our mortal condition, there's a limitation sometimes to, to face certain crises. But if we believe in, in God, and His mercy and His love for us, uh, He has revealed to us that prayer is a channel for us to seek uh, additional help. The last point, trust the Lord in His promises. I know that all His promises will be fulfilled. I know it as firmly as I stand here before you. If we actively trust in the Lord in His ways, if we are engaged in His work, we will not fear the trends of the world or be troubled by them. I plead with you to set aside worldly influences and pressures and seek spirituality in your daily life. Love what the Lord loves, which includes His commandments, His holy houses, our sacred covenants with Him, the sacrament each Sabbath day, our communication through prayer, and you will not be troubled. It's amazing just stepping on the temple grounds. You get emotional because I, I love this temple. Sacred and serene, an oasis in a harsh desert climate. It means everything to be able to return to the Mesa Temple. And a spiritual refuge from the harshness of the world. The feeling 
you get in there, probably the same feeling you get when you go to heaven. The Mesa, Arizona Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will be rededicated after more than three years of extensive renovation. I look forward to it. I hope I get to go. Larry Frost remembers witnessing the original dedication in 1927 as a 10-year-old boy. It took us two days to come down here on a very rough road. Now, at an energetic 104 years old, Larry looks forward to witnessing the rededication of his beloved temple, which has blessed his family for generations, and where he worked as a volunteer for 20 years. My time at the temple was a very choice time. The Mesa Temple holds deep connections to thousands of families that have passed through its doors for nearly a century. The reason why this is special to me is because it's the temple that we were still as a family. Elizabeth recalls selling everything her family owned to make the costly journey from El Salvador to Arizona to be joined together as a family forever. Over the years, large groups of Latinos have done the same, made possible by a significant event that took place in 1945 in Mesa that forever changed temple worship. The first temple ceremony offered in Spanish that now enables millions of families to participate in their native languages across the globe. The connection to the Mesa Temple runs deep with the local community as well. Its grounds are open to all, regardless of belief or faith. The church's invitation to invite the community in for Christmas lights and Easter pageants has created a tremendous amount of goodwill. Improvements were made during the renovation to further enrich those traditions with upgraded lighting and seating for an enhanced guest experience. Also new to the temple grounds, the relocation of the visitor center and a larger reflection pool for an unobstructed view that directs the focus toward the temple. A fresh landscaping design with conservation in mind. We saved over 300 plants and trees that are back on this site that we had to carefully work around. And to conserve a precious resource in this arid environment, a new irrigation system collects and reuses water. The nearly 75,000 square foot structure is the seventh temple of the church and the first to be built in the Grand Canyon state. Its design, a departure from previous temple architecture. The church was coming out of this era of immense persecution and wanted to build temples that fit in with the landscape, that weren't making too bold of a statement. So here in Mesa, they chose a temple without a steeple, without a Moroni, and a colonial revival style. With its terracotta cladding, the colonial revival style structure includes classical design cues, such as an entablature festooned with cartouches resting on faux columns called pilasters and a bas relief on the frieze that depicts the gathering of Israel. You have scenes of America, of South America, of the Pacific Islands, of Europe coming to the temple. And as you get closer to the west entrance, so the main entrance of the building, the figures on those panels become more animated, more lively. They're in a bigger rush to get to the door and enter the building. The exterior improvements, only half the transformation. Significant changes occurred on the interior as well. We had to work with historic structures and new structures and blend them together to make them look like they're unified and part of the same system. Updating with more efficient utility systems, especially air conditioning, were at the top of the list. I grew up in Mesa and my parents, I can remember them saying, oh wow, it was really hot in the temple today. And that has been a constant concern that the patrons are comfortable. Utility improvements required removing some instruction room walls, a few with mural sections that couldn't be safely restored. Remnants of the original pieces now grace other areas of the temple. An artist was commissioned to create new murals to completely cover the walls of each instruction room, similar to how they looked in 1927. The new paintings pay homage to the original artists. It became very connected to feeling akin to them. I, I felt a harmony and a resonance with, with their intent in what I was portraying. Precise alignment was key to hanging the canvases and fitting the room's challenging radius corners and chamfered window enclosures. 
After it's been painted and blended together, it looks like one piece of canvas that covers the entire wall, but it's really 48 pieces. <laughs> I came to really love the painters that originally did this work. One of the most extensive restoration projects in the temple, the Grand Hall Murals, depicting the church's first president, Joseph Smith, and his brother Hiram, sharing the message of the gospel to the Native American nations. And the Baptistry mural, portraying John the Baptist conferring the Aaronic priesthood. Conservators removed layers of paint from years of modifications to reveal the truest version of the original artists. One of my favorite modifications that was removed was the halo of light is back around John the Baptist. Other original oil paintings from a variety of artists are hung throughout the temple, while images of the Savior fill the halls of this sacred structure, reminding guests this is the house of the Lord. cartouches, rosettes, and urns. Design cues popular in 1920s America are ever present. They, along with meticulously handcrafted furnishings, emote a sense of nostalgia. Guests will notice fluted pilasters and marble flooring from Turkey and Spain featured in the redesigned front entrance and new guest waiting area. The marble flooring from the entrance carries through to the grand foyer. Here, illustrations of the colors based on the temple's original 1920s color palette can be observed. More than 50 different decorative paints were used to restore rooms to their previous luster of nearly a century ago. Patrons are going to be able to still recognize their temple because of a lot of the design that we used and added. Cowan says it took painstaking effort and prayer replicate and match the materials used in the temple. One example, original marble for wainscot and base was traced to a quarry in a small town in Utah. Everything that we had matched exactly what was here in, in the historic time. A new waiting area for wedding parties off the grand foyer spans nearly the entire north end of the temple. In the hottest part of the summer when they're still having weddings, they would be outside on the steps or whatever shade they could find. The Grand Hall of Grey Granite, one of the least changed spaces of the temple, refreshed it now appears as it did in the newly completed temple. The bride's room features a crystal chandelier and sconces, walnut millwork, and decorative friezes. baptistry, its purpose to follow the Savior's commandment that all must be baptized. Here, temple patrons can act on behalf of those who did not have the chance in this life. Notable are the rare terracotta mosaic tiles that decorate the font, supported by terracotta-clad oxen that represent the twelve tribes of Israel, and restored paintings depicting the prophet Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery performing baptisms. Unique to the Mesa Temple above the doorways, scriptural passages that invite introspection as patrons progress through the sacred space. Ceiling rooms where families are joined together for time and eternity. In the Mesa Temple, patrons advance room to room. Each instruction room is elevated slightly above the previous one, symbolizing progression toward heaven. This is where devout members learn about God's creation and purpose of life. We come to the temple to make covenants or promises with God. It's where everything we say, we see, we do points us to the Savior to strive to become more like Him. Lustrous crystalline chandeliers highlight a finely appointed celestial room, exquisitely detailed furnishings and decor designed to uplift the spirit and inspire the soul. We use the finest materials and uh, highest quality processes to build a house of the Lord. Entering this sacred space represents the ultimate progression one can achieve toward heaven itself. The Mesa, Arizona Temple, with its rich heritage, stands majestic and renewed, ready to once again serve as a heavenly refuge to families and the community. 
the entire temple in reality is just stunning. The Lord will be very pleased. This is the temple where I grew up. It's everything. This is home. It's home. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has rededicated the Mesa, Arizona Temple following extensive renovations. The Nauvoo Temple strengthened the saints before they had the adversity of crossing the plains and going through what they went through in the pioneer period. That the building of multiple temples throughout the world is likely to be serving the same purpose to prepare the covenant children of the Lord with the strength they need to face for what is ahead. Welcome everyone, and especially the youth of the Mesa, Arizona Temple District to this youth devotional. On Saturday night, youth gathered at meeting houses in Mesa for a devotional. I might have a chance to meet you, so I got ready. Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles surprised some of the youth and their parents by showing up to greet them at a couple of chapels before the broadcast. Make sure your groups are all together. On a mild December day, thousands of Latter-day Saints came to the 94-year-old temple for several rededication sessions. My mom, she grew up right across the street and my grandparents were temple workers here for a really long time so I think for me it's more of just um, like just feeling again that reconfirmation that the temple is the house of God. President Oaks and his wife Kristen were able to take a tour of the renovated temple prior to Sunday's rededication. We were astonished, impressed, gratified with what has been done to hold with the pioneer ancestry of this traditional great temple and house of the Lord. The colors were just incredibly magnificent and they continued the themes throughout the rooms and I, I could not wait to come back and go through a session. A handful of people who attended the temple's rededication were at the original dedication in 1927. I was just about three and I can kind of remember waiting in the laundry room. Not like it used to be. I remember when they built it. It helps us connect the generations. I'm the fifth generation native Arizonan here, so uh, grandma and her, her parents and grandparents were sent down by President Brigham Young in 1878. So, um, so we've been here a long time. As the Mesa, Arizona temple gets ready to reopen, dozens of Latter-day Saint youth and their leaders walk to the temple. I love being in the temple. Um, just any time I can, it really helps me like feel peace and it's just a good place to ponder about questions that you have. I hope to be able to make some appointments to come and do baptisms, but I also hope to just continue to invite people to come and see it, even not going in, but just walking around and seeing the temple. The bride's room is just such a special place and it just really makes me want like to shoot for temple marriage and make sure that my life is like I'm living my life so that I can get married in the temple. Emma Wheeler is looking forward to her wedding as soon as the temple reopens. This temple has been a place of gathering for our family for generations. My parents were sealed here. My grandparents were sealed here. Great grandparents have also made covenants here. It's just one of those places that has always, for me growing up, been a symbol of the temple. Um, it's always been my goal to be sealed here. 